Ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, didn't get that right. Hey, so we got this awesome podcast with Michael Sky that I just got done recording. It's the 4th of July and man, what an amazing thing. You know, we get into this podcast that talks about things which are pretty important when it comes to travel, being an entrepreneur, healing your own trauma, getting into a point where you can see the greater depths of yourself and what it takes as a man. And, and what the real success is. Uh, if you want a discussion with a guy where you can talk about entrepreneurship, making your own money, uh, healing yourself and your community, healing your family, that's what we get into in this podcast with Michael Sky, great guy, I've known him for years. If you wanna find out more about him, definitely give him a shout out. Uh, definitely let him know what's up. His links are all down below. And if this is your first time watching me and this podcast, these are the conversations that we don't want to have, but we're having them. Why? Because your greatness, your ability to connect and communicate and understand perspective with the world is something that we all need. So let's do that. All right. Let's talk to Michael Sky. Boom. What's up? Do or die, Michael Sky. How are you? Where are you at? I am in the south of Brazil, riding out the coronavirus on a little island where I surf in the uh, waves every morning at sunrise. Dang, so you surf? Body surf. Okay. I ride the cool. belly. Yeah. Ride the belly. Yeah, nice, nice. How's the break? <laughs> Man, every morning is different. Some days it's vicious and nasty. Really? You know? Some days it's absolute perfection. Lately it's been freezing. Freezing and nasty. Freezing and nasty. Good. Well, you're just how you like your women. Yeah, exactly, man. Blue and fuzzy. But um, so look, we're we're. I interviewed Hans. You're with Hans in Brazil, and you left from Africa. Or where did you leave? Because it was like crazy, right? Africa. When you guys were traveling. Okay. And I remember Hans caught like one of the last flights, and then. What about you? Uh, yeah, I was in Kenya and I just, I looked around, you know, at the health infrastructure there and how closely people live together and travel together. And I was like, this could get really bad here. Right. Uh, so I said, where do I want to go? You know, where do I want to yeah. ride out the global lockdowns? Cause people were already talking that shit might get locked down for months. Yeah. And I knew, I knew from my travels that, uh, the beaches in Brazil for the, maybe eight months out of the year go mostly vacant and many of the beach houses as well. So uh, I said, yeah, I'll go uh, quarantine myself on the Brazilian beach. Cool. And how are you now? It's been what, three months? Almost four months. Almost wow. Four months. Wow. Yeah. And uh, you happy with your choice? <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, it's Brazil for me though is often about, uh, Brasileiras, you know, the, the yeah. girls here and, and the culture, and the, the, the enjoyment of life and all this. And that's largely missing. The social element is largely missing. People are hiding behind masks. Mostly they've been locked down. And, uh, but I've just focused, I've just been focusing on work 100%. Yeah. So Hans and I have some really intense rituals starting early in the morning. Right. And it's like everything's on time, you know, and it's just, uh, Six days a week, go, 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 go. For those of you guys that don't, don't follow uh, Hans and Michael, they put up these videos every morning, which is good because like you guys, man, let me tell you, it's like, it can be frustrating at times because you, you guys don't work like Americans or I guess that makes sense for Hans, but come on, man. So it's good to actually see you guys do this like consistent thing that's picked up some steam and like brought some stuff. Cause Jesus, man, it's like, God. Well, I got just, Hans working, man. Yeah, I got him working. Yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, he's putting in the time every day. He's working probably three times as much, three or four times as much as when I first met him. Dude, you, seriously. Like, I mean, the dude is, is talented at what he does. He's like one of the few good guys out there doing it. But and it's not to say that he doesn't work. It's just if you're building a business, you have to have like a requirement of bare minimum. Like I feel I need to do more and I like work all the time. So 
It's uh, yeah. and, and I no, love if it. he had your work ethic, he'd uh, if if he had your work ethic, he'd be uh, much bigger for sure. But yeah, I don't think he really thought of himself as having a business as much as just right. like uh, yeah, making making the bare minimum to maintain his lifestyle. So let, let's talk about that. So Hans traveling truly did the like, I'm going to live out of a suitcase and not have any money and pursue beauty or uh, women or adventure and, and these types of things to see where it took him. And, and, and it's really interesting because in our podcast, now it's a little bit different. So there's so much emphatic that we hear from Hans about like what masculinity is and what women and seduction are and, and these types of things, which is so unlike what gave Hans the insights, which was freedom and, and those things still exist, but it's, a, it's an interesting transition. That, what, what, what made that work and what's so cool is the freedom, the lack of money, taking that out of the equation. And now there's like money and business in the equation, which I feel comes with that hardness, that, 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 that kind of determined nature, which is awesome, which is great, but it's a translation. I don't think, I don't think Hans would mind me saying this, but he's been like bragging lately that like every night he's waking up in the middle of the night with the rock hard erection. Yeah. So this is from, from work. <laughs> but it only right? came yeah. after he, you know, it yeah. really got hard with the working, the, you know. The true Tazal. Well, there is also something about uh, testosterone there. You know, if you really, you know, we go out in the freezing cold every morning and we get in the water and we you know so we are kind of uh testosterone of ourselves just being so committed and facing Wait, so much. so so repeat that really quick it delayed so you go out in the water every morning and what well it's freezing you yeah. know so we wake up early before we want to get up yeah. Then we go out to the ocean and get in the yeah. freezing water that we don't want to get in. Yeah. You know, and I think just that we push ourselves with the business and yeah. all of that, I'm sure has an effect on our testosterone. Yeah. I know nothing about the biochemistry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, they say, I mean, like I'm a cold water fan. I've done it for a long time and some pretty insane, perhaps dangerous stuff. And uh, they, they do say it helps the testosterone, but it, it, man, cold water is like a whole nother thing. But just to wake up and, and shock you into it, I think is like such an awesome thing. I think it's an awesome thing all around, but it's just so big. I, the only person, and there's a lot of crazy people that are into it. Maybe I just haven't met them all. Um, and, and this is just a weird side note. This is so dumb, but like, if I'm walking around on the streets in Budapest or wherever, like I never get recognized from YouTube, from any videos I've done with the 21 convention, anything on masculinity, sex, whatever, but, like five times people have been like, Hey man, did you have long hair? Like, Oh, I used to watch your videos on Wim Hof. Like, Oh, they, like it's the craziest thing. So, um, but that man, like that stuff totally changed my life. And the, the craziest people, like they're, they're always just kind of like a little bit nuts and very intense in some way. But this, these people in Costa Rica who are like Wim Hofers and they get like freezers to do it in, um, oh man, they're the best because they're, they're just as crazy as me have taken it like just as far and just extreme with it all. So it's, it's cool to, uh, uh, to meet those hey, people. Hey Steve. Yeah. Let me switch my internet connection. Okay. It'll be a little bit better. Let me just switch to the other line here. It may drop for a second. Yeah, sure. No problem. So yeah, man. Anyway, all this stuff, you, you guys are on this certain adventure. I wanted to ask you about your travel background because your travel background is different like you're always an entrepreneur or independent in some sort of financial situation so you take hans who's been traveling kind of like a gypsy and you travel like a traveler no doubt but there was my assumption that there's always financial security with within that well now there is but when okay. i first took i mean i my first trip to uh real trip outside of the country was a month in Africa in 2006. Okay. And it was okay. not financially responsible to go at the time. And I came back broke because I gave all my money away. In 2010, I went for two months to Africa. Now at that point, I'd already been to Europe and Australia and all that. But this, it was the second trip to Africa. And I went broke there giving away all my money. But I made a lot of money. I took people on safari there. So I, I mean, I, I think I earned 
almost 40,000 from the three week safari I took people on. And then, uh, but I was still broke at the end. <laughs> I was still broke at the end. But um, when I left a few months later, when I left Austin, cause I was just like, man, after my travels, especially to Africa, I came back to the US and I could feel the difference. I felt myself closing up my aliveness. Like the African me that was so out there, so alive, mm. was, was really closing back up. And I said, no, uh, uh, no, I'm not gonna lose that. And I decided to give everything up. I left my business behind. I left everything behind. I sold my stuff, paid off my debts, left on a one-way ticket to Europe and landed with 200 bucks to my name. And I just started following one-way tickets and uh, I started lifting, living through gifting, um, which is a whole kind of uh, mindset and way of doing things, and uh, just following the invitations. And I did that for about seven years. So th this is an interesting thing. So when we get into gifting, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we're going to talk about. Perhaps this may be the most boring, but I, maybe not, maybe not. You're a capitalist. You get capitalism. You understand it, right? One of the things when I see like early entrepreneurs do things for trade, I'm like, man, don't do that. Like, don't ever do that. This is the best way for you not to make money. It's like you're afraid yeah. to take money from people. And so right. in a system of capital, capitalism, and you're working that, and that's your goal to build your business. Like, I feel the name of the game is to make as much money as possible for what you're selling. Like, I mean, the, the market determines the price. You want to be at the, the highest mark for your output and for the value. So that might be a $10 product, but you wanna sell a lot of them. That might be the sweet spot for you, but it could also be a similar product that's $100, you sell less of them. But you wanna maximize like your sweet spot for production. When I see people trade, I'm like, man, I, I get it, I understand it, but you're never going to get ahead. I get that you understand business and you may disagree with me or okay. whatever. Well, of course, like I don't, I don't, to me, trade is not gifting. It's a completely different right. thing. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so, and this was, this was way outside of my paradigm in the beginning, you know, mm. but my first trip to Africa, it was my first time ever gifting my work. And I gifted it to young kids at, at the school. And I was teaching them about entrepreneurship, but it was a hundred percent a gift from my heart. Right. And now a couple months earlier, I did this at a school in Austin and the kids were like, they didn't care. I didn't right. touch them. They didn't give a fuck. But in Africa, the kids, like, man, they came alive. They were so grateful. And I felt so alive. I was like, well, something magical happened here. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to Austin. I'm going to gift my next big event, mm -hmm. meaning not free. You know, free is like when you sit your old sofa on the corner and, and with a free sign on it, someone can pick it up. There's no gratitude there. There's no generosity there. It's just like free, you know, yeah. no one cares. So what right. I did is I, I wanted to gift it to people that I desired to gift it to. So I put together a call that would attract the people I was most inspired to reach. So I said, I'm, um, I'm calling for 30 visionaries from around the world to unite in Austin, Texas, to face everything, avoid nothing and stand for humanity. And then they applied, they went through, they jumped through some hoops. Then I gifted them my whole thing, which is normally uh, $2,500 a person. I had no idea how I was going to make money out of that. There wasn't a business model there, but I was in a, I, a woman I was in relationship with had participated in uh, some seminar thing back in the seventies that she said operated completely by gifting. And people would gift property, people would gift uh, houses and vehicles and lots of money. And some people would gift $5. Some people had nothing, but, and it, it, it seemed to make, it made some sense to me, you know, like if people really get like your full commitment and you, you just want to give everything. And there was a methodology to it. And so at the end of the event, it, it was surprising to me because it was the first event where everything was paid for before the event. Normally wow. after an event where I'm, where it's for profit, right. I, I still have debts after the event. So it was completely in integrity. And then I actually didn't get hardly any money from people. Um, but what happened is I started being gifted invitations, invitation to Brazil, invitation here, invitation there. And the people who received the gift from me, they had so much gratitude. They felt so close to me. 
I all of a sudden had like brothers and sisters and family more so than any other event that I'd ever, that I'd ever put on for money. And uh, some of the things I've been gifted, Steve, are, you know, pretty outrageous. Like I had a client gift me, well, let's call it a rumor just in case uh, Big Brother's listening, but it's $80,000. Wow. $80,000. Wow. So you can, you know, you can talk about for-profit models, but, and it was a complete gift. And she said, do it whatever you want. Like, I believe in you. I support your work. But this is, it's, this is not for your business. It's not for your organization. This is just for you. And so, um, and in 2010, after my second trip to Africa, I'd had a big business conflict with a guy. I had to cancel an event that I was going to give to veterans and conscientious objectors in the military because, because previously guys like that had said that my work had saved their life. They were suicidal and then they come to my event and they had their life back. So I was doing this big, my biggest like gifted thing ever. But I hired this guy, paid him a bunch of money to help me with my web stuff, my video stuff, all of this. He completely just took the money and disappeared. And I went to confront him and go try to deal with him out to San Francisco, and, uh, which didn't work. And, uh, but I got in a cab to go to his place from downtown San Francisco out to his place. And um, when I arrived at his place, this is the big, this is a big city cab driver. He turns around and says, no, man, it's my gift. Wow. What, what the hell just happened? You know, but I started realizing there was a way of being in the world and a way of speaking and all this where people just, they want to join you in this world of gifting, but it's not barter. It's not free. It's something really sacred. It's like a sacred gifting. Yeah, it's an so interesting, I, go ahead, go ahead. Well, that was one of the things that I wanted to explore when I took off on my travels. Yeah. Because it was, it was transforming my life. And I, I, yeah. was, I was like, man, there's something amazing here. So where does, where does somebody start with that? You know, where most people, when I, because what I do is I tell people about this world I'm discovering and how this is happening. And most people join it by starting to gift, you know? So the idea is, it, the, the idea is like, if a guy's got his hand out on the street, if you don't feel a desire to give to him, you don't give to him, okay? But if you do desire to give, you only give the amount that you desire to give. So it's all also very much related to desire, you know? It's, it's, it shouldn't be with any expectation that something's gonna come back to you. It mm. should just be like if, because I think that we have, Steve, so much desire to connect, to love, to give, that is frustrated in a capitalistic culture. Right. Because most people don't want to receive like in America. They, they mm -hmm. think that's something negative, you know? Yeah. I don't, I don't need any help. I got this, you know? I'm independent. I'm a self-made, whatever. I don't need your help, I, you know? And so most people have their barriers up to even receiving. Yeah. So, so I think so many people in our culture, we have this desire to give and to love and all of this, but because of the way the culture is structured, that's very frustrating. Yeah. So the moment that someone, see, they see you just living in this way where you trust in the, the universe or you, you just, you're just giving because of your desire to give, they want to give to you. They want right. to vote for that. They want to support that way of being. And um, yeah, it's uh, pretty amazing. Now, of course, I've come back to uh, um, mostly I'm in the for-profit world again. I came back to serious business in 2017 and uh, uh, our business, our startup business made millions of dollars. And then I, but I've just gotten out of that and I'm going back to other work, but uh, there's benefits of both, you know, there's benefits of both world. And I, um, I think there's great ways to combine them both too. Yeah. So I, I wanted to kind of, I want to talk about a bunch of things, but first the, the model of gifting or giving, I think is very different than sharing is very different than donating. Um, and so this is where people get things mixed up. So I have a code that I work through, through like addiction recovery stuff where, and it's very, well, to me, it's very clear, but there's different interpretations of it, but you cannot one, I want to give face to face. I don't want to do an anonymous like donation. Right. And so when we talk about giving within my groups, which is very important, but it's, it's different than yours. Like you're, you're, you're doing it as a way of life, but, but, 
I, I encourage to do it out of uh, practice, um, like a daily thing, but as a way of life, that's different. Um, so you, you have to give face to face, like the value of your intention, opening a door to give something to somebody without expectation. So it means nothing for you. It's done even anonymously, even though it's face to face, meaning you don't take your identity into it and it doesn't give anything back to your identity. So in that it's a form of, I would call it a spiritual act or an act on principle, uh, that, that you're doing. And there's a big difference between that, like where it's like, you don't talk about it because it shouldn't have meaning. And it's not like it needs to be enforced that you don't talk about it, just the culture behind it of it not having that meaning that it affects you. Um, that's what makes it have its worth to you in, in how it affects who you are as a person. Um, and, and I believe it, it creates this tremendous unity with people. Like if you ever want to yeah. feel a part of, um, yeah. and, and mine is different than yours. You're living, you're talking about a way of life and well, that I've never done. I mean, I, I mean, that's not how I'm living these days, but I did right. that for a number of years. Yeah. But it's, uh, it, it also like has you feel co- like you said, connected right. to people, but also safe. When I was, um, there were times when I would run out of money because I wasn't like trying to make money. Yeah. You know, I wasn't. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, like if, if you're really in this capitalistic mindset, like you almost don't have time for people. You, you, you have to be more productive, more focused. It's very linear. I'm going to make everything happen. You right. know? This other way is kind of like, it looks passive. It looks maybe feminine or receptive. Yeah. But, uh, um, I remember this one time I ran out of, I ran out of everything in Laos. I don't know if I had lost credit cards or my bank balance was just completely at zero but I was completely out of cash. Like I had nothing. Yeah. And it gets a little scary, you know, it's like, where's food coming from today? You know, right. Where am I going to sleep tonight? Uh, and if these survival fears are, are very normal. Right. And I remembered the principle of go out and give, you know, and as soon as I did that, I, my, my nervous system just relaxed because I felt like there's people here who I'm connected to who care about me. I, th- right. I'm this is me trying to understand it, right? I, I think I just felt relaxed because I felt like I have a real heart, beautiful connection with other people. If they find out I'm, um, I need something, they would help me. Yeah. And so, um, and I even like I, it, it, to me, this was another thing I was exploring was what I call tizel, or yeah. it's like a embodied desire. Yeah. I wanted to only move from a true embodied desire, not from like lack or not from my head and all this kind of stuff. So even with making money, like I, um, what I did is I, 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 I made a list of like, okay, who are the people in my life who I'd most love to work with? And then I reached out to them. I called them. I found out what they were going through, what they were facing. And if I saw a way that I could help them, that I desired to help them, I said, um, hey, if I could help you do this and eliminate the time, the suffering, the whatever, would you be interested in hiring me to do it? You know? And if they said yes, I would make them a proposal that, that was exciting to me. And, uh, and I put out like five proposals like that. Mm. And it, depending on what happens, that's what I'm doing next. Depending on who says yes, and they're all completely random like different things. Right. And the one that the first one to say yes was my brother who was looking for a home in Chile, but he didn't speak Spanish. He didn't have any Chilean friends. He didn't have any time to go searching Chile for a home. And uh, my proposal was if you pay for my flight there uh, from Laos and you give me uh, enough money for a one way ticket out and you pay for all my expenses while I'm there, then, uh, I'll spend half of my time there for a couple of months, completely scouring Chile for a place for you to live. And then, I sp- and I did that. So I got on the ticket and I spent half my time, like just having fun and exploring Chile and, and writing my book. And the other time looking for his house. So like, this was the kind of, this is how I was living for a while. Yeah. 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 So man, a couple things with this. I want to say just because like people are so ready to accept gifting and that human exchange in all these different ways. 
I always saw sex in the same way is that people are so frustrated with their political ideas, with traumas they've had, with their own personal experiences, that when they're allowed to have sex in a way where they can truly express and be loved without all this social stuff, they can enjoy sex in all the ways that you have it, which there are many different ways. It could be random. It could be uh, 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 expression of promiscuity. It could be an expression of commitment. It could be an expression of all these different things. But when you allow it, it's like opening the floodgates because everybody's having sex and relationships with all these pressures around it. People are giving, people are sharing time on this weird social construct of like what it's supposed to be and what it's supposed to mean rather than just this freedom, like a true freedom of a human experience. I mean, something's happening and you're not supposed to have a reaction. You're just supposed to be you. And that is your acceptance right. or delivery that when it happens in a way, like you kind of exploit it, right? Because nobody's doing it and everybody's dying mm -hmm. for it. We have a world that's like connecting yeah, like, in all these ways, it, but they're starving. Like we, we can show up to take because mm -hmm. uh, there's such a scarcity, mm -hmm. a scarcity of connection, a scarcity of touch, a scarcity of love, a scarcity of sex. And so when we get it, we, we can try to like take and uh, yeah, for me, like this, this whole journey about tizão, which is, it's a Portuguese word for literally translates like as, as erection or horny. But I, I like to think of it as distinct from wanting something, which is literally like not having, it's like lacking something. And it's more in your head, like I want this, you know. Then the next level would be like to have a desire. It's something I have. It's a pleasure. It's an excitement inside me. Like I desire this. But to Zell is like, it's such a strong physical desire that, that your body it changes. Like you get a heart on or your heart opens and floods you with this warmth and this openness. Um, but it's a physical manifestation of desire. And I started, uh, and, and I think that desire is something that you can share. Like desire is something that you, when you have desire, you can share that. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I there was a time I was with uh, two Brazilian girls, and uh, <laughs> pretty yeah, it was a pretty crazy night. But uh, the way that I used to be many years ago with my desire is I, I wouldn't share it. You know, I wouldn't like express it. I wouldn't like embody it. But um, in cultures like Brazil, there's much more of a welcome for, for desire, which in, in, in a lot of cultures is taboo. Desire, right. sex, all these things. And I just, you know, I was, I was with these girls and, uh, and, and, and they're like, gostosa? And I was like, gostosa, you know, like, mm. you know, just enjoying the enjoyment and sharing that yeah. with them. Um, yeah, to me, it's been a revelation and it relates to giving, you know, like, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. My life was transformed by that journey into gifting and to zone. So then we come to this question of poverty, of not having certain things, of Western privilege. Um, these, these are the geopolitical things which can possibly make this happen but do not take away or or are independent completely independent from the human phenomenon of what you're talking about because you're talking about a human phenomenon that everybody in the world could benefit from but and so this is real clear in terms of recovery like if you don't have your shit together you can't give if you don't mm -hmm. if you don't have you together you can't give mm -hmm. a westerner coming to a society is not going to or, or most likely is not going to have the poverty that certain societies are going to have. And so it makes it possible for you to have this because somebody who doesn't have anything right now, and, and man, this is for real, like it's it affected me deeply in terms of like, oh man, just some of the people I've met and traveling the last nine months, or I guess the last three months I haven't, is there is a different level of life that affects them. And it's, it's bad. I mean, like, I, well, I don't want to call it bad. I work with people who are disadvantaged in the US and people in Colombia or P 
people in Brazil or people in the Caribbean or, or even in Costa Rica, the, the, there's a different level of problems that they can have. But me feeling sorry for them isn't going to help. You know, me trying to control or have power over them isn't going to help. And sometimes just with the Western dynamic or the American uh, being from the U.S. dynamic, it almost puts you in that place. And so I, I guess what I want to what I want to ask you is what type of things have you found you need to keep yourself in check with when you're giving? Because sometimes you might give to somebody and it could be in the US, but they're so in deficit that they swing back and they think it's more than this human experience. Have you run into that phenomenon of keeping it in check? Well, well, first I just want to speak to like the, like a lot of other cultures, some of the ones you mentioned, like Colombia and maybe Brazil and Africa, a lot of these people, they have a wealth that we don't have in the States. Right. A lot of them have a wealth of connection and family, you know, they, they eat meals together. And whereas in the States, we barely have time to meet a buddy for coffee, Yeah. you know, on Tuesday. And They have, uh, like, when I was in Africa, this is one of the things that struck me, you know, like I would see women going to the river with their basket of clothes in their hand with a few other women, with a bunch of kids, all dressed in bright colors, and the sun is shining down, and they're singing on their way to the river, and then they get in the river, and they're singing and playing, and it's like, it's all together, and then dinner, like, dinner happens all together. We would get invited for tea sometimes and leave, like, five, six hours later. It was just like there was there was wealth that they had that we didn't. Mm-hmm. And I remember that was my first trip. And uh, I remember feeling like I truly received so much more from Africa and Africans than I had to give. And uh, mm-hmm. and, and it, it was weird because they, it's like they had all this time, but they didn't have all the time saving contraptions that we have. Mm-hmm. They didn't have, and then they weren't using, they weren't uh, uh, hyper-focused on all these uh, time-saving devices and tools and, you know, microwaves and this and that. And what I realized is Amer- as Americans and Westerners, we try to get things done even faster so that we have even more time to do more and go faster. Mm-hmm. So it's like right. the extra time that we get doesn't turn into a wealth of time. It turns to even, even less time. Well, it serves the intention behind it, yeah. So, um, but to answer your question about like limits on giving, well, well, one of the things I'll say is like in these cultures, what I realized is that giving is, it's part of a way of life. It's surviving, you know, like if you're not generous when you're poor, you're going to be fucked when you run out of money. Yeah. You know, and people who are poor, um, in general, in, I think in most places around the world, they live a lot through gifting and sharing and, and sharing resources and, and so on. Um, and, uh, and I think a lot of us Westerners, we don't want to get that connected to poor people because if we really empathize with them and felt them, what they were facing, maybe we'd leave, maybe we'd end up with nothing because we'd give it all. <laughs> we'd give it well, all I, th- I, I think also there's a fear of it infecting you. Like people build barriers. Like if I'm around poor people, that mindset's going to get around. It's, it's really ridiculous. So one thing that I noticed, I remember the first time I was out of the country for a long period of time, I lived out of my car in Mexico in like 2003 or four or something like that. And uh, I just realized like oh, all these people know who they are. They know who they are. They know their family. They know, they know these things that are really important to them that Americans don't know. And just Westerners in general, like you don't know. You don't know what your family means, what your town means, where you're from. And there's no identity of these things happening. And I just noticed the difference. But then I noticed as I really started traveling in 2008, 9, 10, 11, is that there was a group of very privileged, you know, Aussies, Americans, whatever, you know, that got this great joy of seeing the world and being able to pop in wherever, you know, and and, uh, just go, oh man, I could live in this this village in uh, 
uh, wherever, you know, in Peru and feel so welcome and great. But then I can go back to America and never have to deal with the, the issues that that village was. And that's like one of the worst things. And because it's so takey, it's so, you know, all the things wrong with, you know, what, what kind of could happen or whatever, because at the time that whatever village or, or, you know, it was welcoming. It's great. It's like, this guy's amazing. But at the end, that man or woman walked away with the, the gift of or perspective or whatever that he or she got and didn't respect it in the way that they have to live it. And that I think is a, is a really careful thing that, that we need to think about. Cause it's like travel. Why not? Why only live within the narrative of what uh, your culture, which might be disempowered like a Western culture is, but then you need to have some guidance on what it means to be exposed yeah. to other cultures. And man, I haven't fully figured it out, you know? Well, I think most, uh, I've, you know, this, this has been a big inquiry for me as well as I've traveled. And uh, a lot of people travel as tourists and it's more to take, you know, it's kind of like you're walking into a zoo, which is that foreign community or whatever. And you want to get your photos of the different creatures and you want to, kind of stay in, in the safe places and stay where it's comfortable and you pay for everything. And if you show up paying for everything, you're just a consumer. You are a taker of their right. culture, of their world. There's not a genuine connection. Right. But the person that shows up as a tourist, they also miss the most beautiful gifts of that place. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Because they're not gonna be invited to yeah. the, the family dinners. They're not gonna yeah. be invited on the grand advent, the real adventures. Yeah. They're gonna get a fake kind of experience of everything. Yeah. And I think of my, you know, I was in uh, Northern Thailand living there for a while, um, 2013 to 14, probably six months out of both years I was there. Um, and I developed relationships with there were people, there was a, there was a woman from a, they call them, well, they call them the hill tribe. They're, they're ethnically Chinese, but they, uh, they live in the mountains of Northern Thailand and most of them don't have citizenry or whatever. Um, so they're kind of, they're, they are really a minority disadvantaged community. And in these massage shops where you can go get like $7 Thai massage or 14 bucks for two hours or whatever. Uh, man, I would go there like every day, every other day. And I really built a relationship with these people. And uh, I really wanted to go to their village, you know, like I really was curious about that. And there, there's signs all over the place for the tourists where you can go to the Hill Tribe Village as a tourist experience, you know, and to me, that's kind of like disgusting. Like, yeah, I wouldn't want to show up in someone's house in some, uh, maybe even it's a fake village or it's a real village, but they're just there every day taking pictures of these, yeah. you know, the, the long neck people or whatever. And I was like, man, I would feel, I, I would feel embarrassed to do that. But I got so connected to these people. And, and at times when it was appropriate, I shared, man, I would love to see where you live. I would love to, you know, I'm really curious about your culture, all this. I end up getting several invitations to go and join them and stay with them, eat with them, go to their festivals and stuff like that. Where like, I'm the only foreigner. And, uh, but it's because of the connection. It's because I showed up, I was generous with them, with my spirit, with my time, with my money, with whatever. And I wasn't, I was showing up generously and generatively, not as a, not as a taker. What in your travels is the saddest thing you've seen that you can talk about? That, that you wouldn't uh, see in the U.S.? Well, the, the first, okay, a few things that come to mind. One, and I guess they're both the, kind of, they're at the same place, actually. There was, so there was an orphanage that we went to in 2010. Must have had a few hundred kids. Um, this, is in, this is in Kenya. And, you know, we arrived there, and um, there were, very few adults and just tons of kids with no parents. And like that in itself is heartbreaking, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, there was this one little girl, she must've been about 
two or three, maybe about three. And she and I, we just had a connection, you know? And I picked her up. She's just this precious little thing. She just kind of clung to me. And I, it was heartbreaking thinking, I'm, I'm getting uh, emotional thinking about right. it now, but like, she's got no parents, you know? She's yeah. here by herself, bending yeah. for herself. And who knows if she's exposed to abuse or whatever else. Right. And, but she, she just like clung to me like I was her father or something. And so that was one. And then with her, as we're going through this, this orphanage, there was a girl there who had been raised by baboons. And this was weird. Like she, she sat on the floor like a baboon. She didn't make direct eye contact and her head was always going back and forth like this. When she had to move, she would push off like the back of her hand. Like it, she, she had been dropped off, we suppose, in the national park as a, maybe as an infant or as a very young toddler and then had been raised by baboons. And just to think of like, man, she was the size of an adult baboon. So I wonder, you know, I wonder what she was exposed to, but she'll never be become like full human. She'll never have a human life. She can't speak a language. She, uh, How old was she? Maybe eight, nine. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, so this is one of those things that it's so weird. When I look at it from a cultural standpoint, I can walk away from those situations because you see, like, the United States is amazing in these, or, you know, Western civilization. And there are problems. There are major, major problems. And there, there's an almost immediate thing you notice when you integrate into other cultures in, in an open sort of way. But when you see that pain, and you can walk away from it and other people can't, that can create a problem, you know, with the, like a colonialist mindset and so on. And, and technically this is, but where I always see an answer is within recovery because you see people disadvantaged. I mean, somebody who's had complex trauma, meaning a whole lifetime of trauma, that this is their language of how they're communicating to have to sit down at a table and eat with a fork and knife is, out of their reality and so to learn that it's like you're not learning to use a fork and knife and you're good it's like no you have all this stuff and then you're learning and forcing yourself to use a fork and knife and your whole emotional makeup and psychological makeup comes from this past of you know whatever sort of horrific stuff came from that the interesting thing in recovery is that you can't well this is my opinion right to have an ego around it to have an identity around it. Again, the anonymous point that it is not for that. It is only for the personal connection bigger than you that is serving the intention, right? And we were talking about like serving the intention. America's, Americans or Western people do things to save time. Like we, we've, we, in the 70s, you know, we didn't have car seats, we didn't have AC. We, well, some people had AC. We, we had like, freeways that didn't have you know what they have now we didn't have the same fast food outlets we couldn't eat now you can sit in a car be climate controlled you can talk on the phone with a friend you can watch something you can get anything you'd want to eat but everybody's still unhappy about traffic right and so the intention wasn't to serve happiness while being on the road it was to serve happiness so that we could do more and get more for our society and so when we bring in intention to how we're helping people it needs to serve the higher principle of what that is, which it sounds like you have a very established thing personally that you know on giving and gifting and what that means. But a lot of people walk into it going with guilt, with shame, with, uh, with a, a desire for power, uh, you know, a moment to feel good. But it's not, sometimes you feel good and sometimes you may not feel good. But if you can go in with serving whatever that principle is for you, and like I said, in recovery, it's established. This isn't you. It's, it's only to serve, you know, this whatever higher cause of giving, you know, um, is it was given to you. That somehow brings peace. And, and I've, I think more people talked about that amazing thing because the gift of traveling, the gift of worldly perspective is so awesome, but it is almost impossible for it not to be exploited you know every time i get on a plane to go to a country especially that has 
some sort of like sex trade or, or some or, or high level of prostitution, you see the same group of guys like old men who like more power to you if that makes you feel good and you're not causing, you know, direct harm, go for it. But you could be causing indirect harm in some big ways. You know, um, I see young kids going like, man, I can play, you know, and by all means, like you're going to, you got to be a kid, go play. Um, and then you see like the people traveling there who live there and they're all so different. Like they're, they're all bound by these barriers of how they socialize and connect and perspective and nobody's really merging. And that, I mean, that's like a real, real tragedy. I think for those older men looking for love, that's what they're looking for. And they may get that, right? But you don't necessarily have to start well, from like the mail order bride, you know, sort of perspective. And the young kids, like, you don't need to start just on like making money with zero overhead, you know, type things. I think there's a, there's a deeper thing that people need to be talking about with travel because it's so beautiful and it'll change you forever. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Well, Hans and I are working on a project now. In fact, I've, the past month or so, I've been writing a guide, which I'm going to give away online. Um, uh, I'm calling it Secret Kingdoms, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, you know, in our, our group that we're forming, we're calling it Los Conquistadores. And both of those can sound very privileged and very they, much they, about they taking. They sound pretty tyrannical. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I like that aspect because it's controversial yeah. and it also is just unapologetic about like it whatever, also but, speaks you know to a westerner they get it right away you know and the idea is the idea is you know there's so many men in the west who are angry frustrated um they're not happy with the local dating scene the the way we do relationships and family or the family court system or the economy or the politics or the the environment that they live in, but most Americans don't really travel. Like we might, we might take a trip to Cancun or we might go to a, a resort in some other country that's very Americanized with a bunch of other Americans there. But most of us don't really travel. And we don't, and even guys who, you know, I, there's a lot of expat communities abroad. You know, these are people who've moved outside of the States but mostly they just live with each other as well. So they go, you go to a gated community in Panama and you live with a bunch of other uh, uh, Americans and Canadians, Australians who've left their country and you, you get some benefit and excitement about being there, but you're still just tourists. You're still, totally. yeah. you're not, you, you don't really get to ex experience the, the magic of the place and the culture. And so the idea behind the idea is like every man should have a secret kingdom. This is a place that he could escape to anytime he wants or go and the leave and live his life there or retire there or whatever. So that he, he knows of a place where he feels welcome. He feels wanted. He feels respected and he feels free and it, and the living is easy so that he doesn't have to tolerate, um, any of that, any stuff that he doesn't want to back in his home country. So he can, he really has a choice. So he's really free. And I think if more men had an experience, they tasted what life could be somewhere else, they would choose it. And then you would have less people at home fighting with each other and uh, protesting in the streets and whatever. I mean, even think about all this stuff going on now. Um, you know, <laughs> this is like, there's a bunch of black people now talking about just having their own piece of the U.S. or their place with, for just black people. And some people say, oh, well, that's racist or whatever. But why not? If they feel better together, safer, um, uh, more welcome, whatever, what's this, you know, what's, why can't we all just uh, go and find our welcome? Why is it that we tolerate uh, putting up with relationships, families, communities where we're not fundamentally welcomed and respected. And so I have an American, uh, African American guy who was 75, 76. He heard his son had heard me talking about my trips to Africa. And his son came to me and said, Michael, we, will you just speak to my dad? Uh, he really wants to go to Africa. At least he says he does. He's never going to go, but will you just entertain him with your stories? 
I said, fine, okay, yeah, I, I will. So he, his dad came down and I saw how much his dad really lit up with my stories of Africa. And I, and I started, you know, selling him on, I was like, Archie, you know, we should go, we should go. <laughs> and the next year he came with me, he came nice. with me on a three, three week safari slash sabbatical to Kenya. Well, and the idea is we're not just, we're not there as tourists. You know, we did go on safari, but we did it guided by my local friends, my right. Maasai friends, and we have deep connection to the people there. And I introduced him to an African woman there, beautiful African woman who was 30 years old, so like 45 years younger than him. He went back the next year and married her, tried to get her, tried to get her entry into the States, which he couldn't. So he, I just ran into him earlier this year and last year he now lives in the countryside he's 82 years old he's changed his whole life from dallas texas where he was just a retired widow um he was like a driving instructor for sears living a completely normal american life <laughs> to all of a sudden he's living a dream in the countryside of africa with some goats and chickens in a garden and a beautiful wife who's 40 years younger than him and you know a couple of young kids running around and uh, I think that, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about that idea, man. I think if, I, th I think this is a, an idea that most Americans never consider because we, we live kind of in fear that four years from now, the other party is going to get elected and then change all the rules and the laws and change the culture and change the country. And we get angry about that. We're afraid of that. And then we have to battle over, you know, one fifty percent of the country is forcing the other fifty percent of the country to live how they want them to live, and it's to me, I think what we're going to see in the future is forms of government and for, and ways of living life where we're not fighting to control each other all the time. We're just saying, hmm, why don't I just go and be with the people where I feel at home with? Easier said than done. Um... Man, there's a lot I kind of want to talk about within all of this. I want to kind of go back to you stay in contact with a lot of these people. And so you've been traveling for over a decade. You've seen people that were young that you met grow up. Um, what, what is the difference with how, let's say, a, a young man or woman that you met grew up in Africa or wherever you have the most travel experience with, um, what is the difference when they're in their 20s or they're in their, their you know, 30s or mid 20s or whatever, that's different from an American growing up? Well, my first thought is Uganda. I spent five months there in 2014 uh, with a, a, a friend who I'd met on the internet eight years earlier and helped him start some small businesses and stuff. Um, a lot of them over there, they, they, they think that they have one way to make it in life. And it's, it's basically this, it's get, in the, get into the top 10% of my class, get a scholarship to university because I won't be able to pay for it. My family can't pay for it then graduate from university and hopefully get a government job. It's, and then, then, I, then I'm cush, you know, I'm, I'm good. But most people there who even graduate from university, they don't find a job or they, they really work at, you know, I mean, you see this more and more in America now where people graduate with a doctorate in something and they end up working at Starbucks, you know, but right. yeah. um, it's even more dire there that they, that they don't, uh, they don't really see, for example, entrepreneurship as an option, or they don't, um, a lot of them don't, yeah, realize there's other possibilities. And my friend, he had, you know, he had gone to school and while he was at university, I'd helped him start a few small businesses and he made a little bit of money. And, and uh, but then he went and took a cush job at a, at a, as Dean of Students at a high school in the countryside. It's a beautiful, beautiful place where I stayed. And um, 
it was funny because the guys on the corner at the end of the road that, that leads to the main road from the school who are just like selling, cooking and selling meat on the corner. Uh, they were making more money than him. They were probably doubling at least his salary as a dean of students. But he had the status as dean of students and he wouldn't lower himself uh, to their status to, to kind of get ahead. And so you see a lot of that kind of mentality, I guess, where um, I think status matters so much there. Um, and, and when it comes to wealth, like their idea of if you're wealthy, it basically means you did something nefarious. You, you did something illegal. You took it from mm. someone. And so they have a lot more stigma about uh, making money than we do. And if you do make money, it's expected. It's the kind of that more poor mentality that you're going to share it with everyone else. So they don't have an idea of like saving for the future and uh, yeah, a lot more hurdles there. So when I went there, one of the things I bring when I go to Africa is just ideas about the possibility of being an yeah. entrepreneur, of making money, of, you know, this sort of thing is, is a real gift over there. It's interesting because same thing for me, I'll talk to people and be like, why aren't you teaching Spanish online? Why aren't you uh, like, like, man, there's so many just different business you could do. You can translate, you can write both English and you, you don't realize your power, you know? And so you, you get all this, but then running a business and the trials is like capital is hard. It challenges you. No money is given away easy, but you see this, but it almost can't be done because uh, you know, the culture, the, the mindset, all these different things going into it that produce all these difficulties. I, one of the things that like, man, I think about a lot is that, and I think about this in terms of trauma or pain, a kid that feels trauma needs a certain type of therapy that still allows them to play, still allows them to do, still allows them whatever. But, and then in adolescence, that changes in a different way. And then there needs to be a different perspective in the approach of healing those things. But in my opinion, man, the real healing for somebody who has this advantage, it comes a little bit later in life. And I think that's just how our brains physiologically shape and develop. The healing then, for, for someone who has this advantage? Or do you say disadvantage? Disadvantage or, or whatever. So has like trauma. Uh -huh. When you see that in other countries, like especially even with the entrepreneurship and independence, the culture, you know, helps promote that, which you can see directly. You can see directly. It's like the culture does, there's nowhere to go or talk to or see people um, that are doing this. But then when you go to Medellin or uh, you can see this in Costa Rica, there's a ton of entrepreneurs there. In Costa Rica, they've been there for generations where very few Costa Ricans will buy into this or understand it. And then if they do, they make a complete switch and abandonment of their culture to, to do it. And that's not necessarily good, but where it comes into this like weird aspect, or maybe not weird at all. I think it should be talked about of issues that they faced well in a lesser income society or just different things culturally that'll happen. Um, and maybe not, but there, there's more of it there definitely in Colombia. When Colombia starts to go through this change, if it does, dude, man, the, the women there have seen a lot more damage than, uh, man, I, this could tie into so many things, but, but it's, it's tough, you know, like to go to just be expected that if you're beautiful, that you've had to deal with like rape, assault, um, real pressures about forced sex and forced imagery yet at the same time like under they understand more about femininity than maybe uh they're, they're very secure with that than an american woman and i don't want to say that the problem solved but, but it's a pretty distinct thing to see that when they get into this kind of like open market sort of thing there's a different pressure that may come to them woman or man of all that baggage of of poverty that comes into it. You hear African Americans talk about it. You see Latin, uh, you know, Chicanos talk about it. You see people 
talk about this mindset. You see white men, white men and women in America talk about it. This is the unique aspects, the very particular unique aspects of that poverty make it, and that's the real fight. You know, in some ways that's the real trauma that's gonna get you uh, independence in terms of your expression financially, independence in terms of your relationships. And yeah. uh, I, I, I just- It's interesting, man, because, because in a way, to make it well in a poor community, you do best by giving, 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 giving. But if you really want to attain a level of wealth beyond that or create a business that really takes off, um, you can't just give away everything. You have to save and invest and focus on the long term and buy early so that you can get the discount. And then it's a complete different mindset. And I didn't realize, you know, I went in as one of the really maybe typical naive Westerner in the beginning to help out over there. And in 2014, I mean, it was my third trip to Africa by that point. And I thought I'd, I thought I'd learned a lot, you know, and then maybe I have, but um, I was there five months in Uganda and I was teaching entrepreneurship and I was helping the young kids encourage them to write business plans. And I told them I was going to try to help them find funding to start a business. And only two of them made it, you know, finished their business plans. One was my longtime friend who was about you know, 30 or so at that time. And then another kid who was about 20. And uh, I got my brother to put up 20 grand. And uh, we went and, and bought a used van for the one guy to have a taxi business. And for the other guy, it was, we bought him a, motor, a little motorcycle with a, a, a corn harvesting machine that he could put on the back of the motorcycle to harvest corn. And uh, that was, it was, yeah, there's a lot of stories there, but the, the idea was going to be that, and I had to leave because I'd overstayed my visa, but they were going, I was going to mentor them every week with running and growing their business. Um, and then I was going to come back and, and they were going to be mentors for other young kids who would help start a business. And we would build an academy for entrepreneurship there. And it would be through mentorship and through helping each other and, and, and all this. And, but seven months went by and uh, at, each one of them is supposed to pay a little bit towards repaying the loan to my brother. Neither of them paid a single shilling over seven months. You know, how many weeks is that? <laughs> 30 weeks. Mm -hmm. And the last two months, my longtime friend just went completely AWOL. He didn't, he went out of communication. And uh, I was in Chile talking to my brother and I was like, man, you know, this is like, I vouched for these guys. This is your money. This is not okay. And mm. uh, I'll go back and make things right. You know, if you, <laughs> I didn't have money at that point. I was like, if you want to pay for me to go to Uganda, I'll go handle business, you know? So I went back there uh, to get respect, respect for my brother, but to also teach these guys a lesson, you know, like it's not cool to just, I don't want them to learn. They can just take advantage of whoever's being generous with them. I want them to learn serious principles of like business and how you succeed. And it's not through scamming people or lying or whatever. So it's a long story, man. But I went back and uh, rumor is I may have bribed some uh, state police <laughs> to drive across the country with me through the night and get these guys. Um, but uh, I realized, and then I, then I had, Man, it's a, it's a whole long story, but... Yeah, no, go for it, go for it. Well, so we apprehend these guys and... Uh, or apprehend the, the, my longtime friend and his older brother who had the van, which is the majority of the investment. We get them locked up back in Kampala, Uganda. And, uh, and I think, okay, yeah, I got my van back from my brother, whatever, whatever. I didn't realize I had just bribed the most corrupt institution in all of East Africa, which was the Ugandan National Police Force. <laughs> so uh, my problems had only started because now they have my vehicle, you know, and they're going to try to extract maximum cash out of me. Um, and they're also open to whoever pays them the most cash. So if it's the guys I put in the jail, if they happen to round up the most cash, they're going to get the vehicle that belongs to my brother. And, uh, and the police are trying to extort the Indian company that sold us the vehicle. They're trying to extort these two guys in jail and uh, they're trying to extort me. So, um, but what I didn't 
you know, some of the things that I, like if I had it to do differently, I would do it very differently. And I would realize how much family and community matter. I would have gone to these guys' villages. I would have met with their family, with their parents, with their elders. I would have had the commitment and the agreement be with them so that there's a lot more at stake for these individual guys if they F up, you know? If they F up, they're gonna fuck it up for their community and their family. And I'm gonna have relationships with their people. That would have been the way to do it. But instead, it was just between me and this guy and between me and this guy. And um, yeah, so th there's so much I learned that I just did not realize about the thinking sure. is different, the culture is different. And, and this other guy, this other kid who had the motorbike and the, and the corn harvesting machine, his father, this is as far as I know that this is the truth because over there there's uh, could be a, you know, they don't, they don't, a lot of cultures don't value um, freedom of speech and truth like we do in the, in the West, especially in the U S what's a higher value to them is saving face. And uh, um, which was great learning for me as well. So like when I'm trying to have these coaching sessions with these guys, I didn't realize they can't tell me some of the stuff that's going on with their business, the problems they have, because it'll make them look really bad. And then they're afraid of what will happen with me and them. And like, so like, there were so many things that were messed up in my thinking about how things work over there. I realized I was a big part of this whole, uh, making this not work, you know, yeah. but this yeah. one guy's father, he felt like, well, I'm, I'm his father. So he took all the maize that had, the corn that had been harvested and he sold it and kept the money for himself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, and, and as soon as this guy went back with the, the, the motorcycle and the corn harvesting machine, he's now like the pimp of the village, you know, he's got his choice of the women. Mm -hmm. He can afford the booze. Everyone's borrowing money from him. He's like, he's the big shot in the village now, higher status than the elders. Yeah. So I didn't realize how much just like helping them out with a business or a loan or something like this would F them up if not done correctly. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's a whole complex thing. And then that moves into like, if I'm going to give something, I'm going to give it with power and intention and I'm a boss, which then takes you out of the real element of giving. It's, really tough but you know what i always think is it's most important for anything i put out whether it's expression uh, salutation an exchange of love or giving to come in with to serve connection and most of the times i don't think about that but on the important things or the things that i screw up in life and that's the worst thing there could be a ton of things that i've done that cause damage that i don't even think about because i haven't seen it um, or felt it but those things that cause damage it's very, very important for me to walk in with the intention of the connection. Like, how is this going to connect? And that's what's most important. That overrides to me everything. And, and this can be very selfish because you can go like, man, if I want the connection to, to serve, I might withhold certain things or might not bring certain things up. I mean, that could get exploited by human selfishness in these massive ways. But, but to really honor and worship the the different ideals you believe in and serve i think are super important but yeah man it goes so sideways so let's jump to this we have a culture in the u.s full of individuals who feel disempowered in many different ways so you could take women you could take different ethnic groups you could take different socioeconomic classes and so on they feel disempowered and I feel they're searching for the collective to make better. And the metaphor for this, and I think those things are both important, but if we have, let's say, you take to women who are pissed off about women's rights, right? And feminism, and, and there's all sorts of different expressions of those things. And, and they served a purpose. I don't even think that they're, like a lot of people just hate on it so much like hate completely on the, uh, uh, those aspects of whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, feminism or female expression or female empowerment. I think they were there for a reason. But then you take these women that have been disempowered and it has now become something to serve an expression of the culture. 
what the cultural collective is, which can be money, status, fame, whatever. And we've seen this great, great thing, which started out as like equal rights or whatever you want to call it, eaten up by a culture. And it's so freaking selfish. And, and it's not just feminism. Same, same exact thing in men's rights. There are women all around the world who have a, or even locally, you know, who have a lot of problems. They don't care about them. They care about them to make their argument that women suffer so that they can be better, so that they can get a better job, so that they can be louder on Facebook or win the argument, which doesn't solve the problem. And men's rights does the same exact thing. Oh, the court systems are screwed up. I could tell you how the court systems are and aren't screwed up you know, just from working in this industry. And they're not as screwed up as people say. The court systems for an American male are not as screwed up. It's just people don't know how to use it. And there are some things that are expensive or um, that might be unfair, but it's not nearly as bad. It's ignorance, which keeps men from being able to empower themselves with their court and legal stuff, even if they don't have money to hire a lawyer. It, it's, it's pathetic. And then they get caught up in this like whole thing that they're victimized and they have to be when at the same time, they're complaining that the essence of man commits more suicide or falls more into addiction. Dude, I work with those people like this is I'll, I'll say this, the, the tragedy that I see within my work, I work with people that do kill themselves that people I know die and I will not see again, every month, like clockwork. I mean, that's just the vicious part of addiction. So when I hear people talk about like men's rights and the survivalhood of men, like you're using that as a platform to be louder, bigger. You don't fucking care about the cause. You need the cause to justify you being a dickhead, to justify you being selfish, to justify you not having to look at your pain. And that's again, the individual, the individual walking in with this problem that may have been given to him by the collective, but then not solving their own individual problems and going back to the collective. So I know you wanted to talk about some of these issues going on in the US. Um, you had said beforehand, uh, like Black Lives Matters, a couple other things, I forget what they were. But so what, what is your take on this? What is your take on this disruption that is happening socially? And it's been happening for a long time in the Western world. Well, I grew up, I think of this through the lens of, uh, first of all, religion, because I grew up Mormon and it was very, so we are the righteous, the good, God's chosen people. And uh, outside, out there are the people of the devil, the people who are uh, led astray, the people who are not connected to the Holy Spirit, the, you know, and like I would get blessings from my father before going into the school during the school year, warning of like, that I'll have the wisdom to decipher what truth from falsehood and not be led astray and all this kind of thing. So this kind of very white and black world, um, not speaking about race here, obviously, but although Mormons were almost yeah. exclusively white at the time and still are mostly white, but yeah, very polarized. But, but to me, that's just how the world was. And then at 14, my parents divorced. And here are these, in my mind, here are these two like righteous figures. Like we had, we also had status inside of the church. So we were kind of like, these are the good people within the good people. That was us, you know, mm -hmm. and my parents and uh, two very righteous people. But now they're at war with each other. And my mom's saying this about my father and about this and that. And then my father's saying this, and they're completely opposed. And uh, this this was incredibly stressful for everyone involved. It left us all traumatized. And here it is. This is a religion that, that puts family even before church. We believe the family is together for all of eternity. And here we are going to war, destroying the family. And for what? You know? So this became something that fascinated me. And I, and I started studying it. And this is where my life's work came out of, is trying to resolve the, these conflicts. Because I would see, like, all of my siblings siding with my mother and cutting out my father completely. I worried that my father might kill himself when I was a teenager. I really like, I would wake up worrying if like my dad was still alive. And, uh, and then I would see like all my siblings side against my mother. And now they're with my father, but they're against my mother, you know, and I had plenty of the same worries about my mother, 
you know, and the, the, what ostracization does and the shaming and judging what that does and how that rips people apart. And uh, I was, I think maybe because I had often been like an outsider and left out myself, I could never take the side of everyone else against that one other person. I just could never do that, you know? So it's like, I was always in the middle. And the thing about being in the middle is both sides feel like you're with the other side because you're not mm -hmm. just on their side. You yeah. know? And this is very similar to like what you see like with Black Lives Matter now, like you're with us or against us, you know? But these, these it, it's kind of like a cult-like mentality. Even when you go to divorce, both sides are trying to build a case against the other. What's true is that this person is this, this, and that. This is what happened. This is what should be done. This is what shouldn't be done. It's, come up, it's almost like a, a, a different world. And the other person's like, no, no, the truth is that it's like this. This person's a bastard, and he did this, and da-da-da, and here's the true story. And that the two different worlds that they both feel righteous inside of, happy to go to war and destroy these people who they once loved. And to me, this is like, this is religion. This is, this is what families do. This is, this is human nature. So when I see it play out in the culture wars, um, I'm seeing the same dynamics that you see in a divorce type of situation there. The courtroom is society and it's being played out and different parties are on the stand. You know, the, uh, the white man is guilty of all this and blah, 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 blah. And here's the truth of it. And, and you know, and, and if you don't agree with the truth and you're one of the bad guys and then you have... And then because that's, that position is so strong and judgmental, you, they start to build an enemy. So the enemy grows stronger. The opposition to them grows stronger. And then they go to war, you know. Um, so these dynamics fascinate me. And, uh, yeah, my life's work is, is designed around how do you deal with that? How do we be with that? It's interesting because, like, I, I just want to bring it back to the individual because I think that's where the big solution is. Here's a kid who's 14 years old who bought into a belief system, which could be good or bad. It serves plenty of good. It serves bad, whatever. You hear all sorts of stuff about Mormonism. Um, our, the United States welfare system was based off of the Mormon church. But the Mormon church makes it work, smaller community, you know, um, or maybe you could argue that. Um, but you take this kid who's 14, gets traumatized by it. And again, when you're younger or an adolescent and you hit a big blow in your life, you, you're going to handle it in a certain way. Like the therapeutic process works in you know, a whole diversity of ways, but it does take on a unique characteristic of that 14-year-old kid, 15-year-old kid. Then goes out at some point, gets his feet underneath him, searches for the world to find some meaning and understanding because your belief system got taken away. But it's interesting because, and then you find those truths, you find these different realizations, you look to the bigger world, you look to the new, perhaps God of human socialization and community and togetherness in this filter. But then your work is exactly this. How can two parties communicate saying completely different things, but understand each other, even become each other. And then through that, bring that in front of one another and then heal, it's it, which I'm talking about the honor work, right? So uh, it's interesting, you know, this is a good example of how pain and trauma gives you a greater insight to self, but then through helping individuals to then inspire the collective. The problem with society is it's so freaking big. And the way that we see social movements change is revolution, rebellion, taking, suppression. There has to be, I'm not saying there has to be, I hope there's not, but this slow burn of conscious development is much different. And I think the best way we've seen it is te technologically, you know, but, we, but our, techn our technology is allowing communication to go bigger, um, other different influences. I mean, you know, what, what happened, with the uh, uh god man in minneapolis is is horrible right nobody's saying that that's like a, a good thing or defending it but if we didn't have social media that wouldn't have erupted but then we also got to look at like why did it erupt you know we can't just deny it i can sit there well, I, and I see that uh you know we can we can look at our technology you know has really advanced our physical world technology has I mean, we can fly to the moon, we can, uh, 
we can have this I'm in Brazil, you're in Texas, and we can mm. instantly video communicate. I mean, it's, it's crazy, incredible. Yeah. It yeah. solves problems we never, never even thought of as problems because we never thought there could be a solution. It's just, of course, you can't talk yeah. to some guy in Brazil instantly over a video, you know? Right. But, uh, but our, in the social realm, in the human realm, in the relational realm, our level of technology is, is still like in the dark ages, you know? It's still at the Stone Age. We're still, you know, right. And I, I evidence this by just look at a at a husband and wife. You love each other. You see the greatness in each other. You have this vision together. And then a number of years later, it's like the other person is the total the embodiment of evil, and you're trying to destroy each other. And the fact that so many relationships end up like this to me is just evidence that our level of tech, you know. When I say technology, I just mean a better way of doing something. Our way of communicating, understanding each other, getting our needs met, these sorts of things is so low level that, that it's still ending in complete disaster. And as you know, I mean, you use different methodologies and stuff with the men that you work with. And a lot of it comes from addiction recovery and stuff like this. They have different tools. They have 12 steps. They have these kind of things. These things are technology. The 12 steps is a technology for dealing with addiction, for dealing with other things to get in your life back to a more whole place. So like what I'm excited about is, is the realm of human technology. That's what I think is going to really make the difference when it comes to things like, like the culture wars and Black Lives Matter and, and divorce and all these sorts of things. I believe that, well, over time, we are developing better and better and better and better ways of, of relating and communicating. You think of um, nonviolent communication, for example. That's sure. a technology for having things work out better. But then how does it get shown? You know, like th there's an argument, which I don't agree with. Um, but, but again, it's like, man, what, what do I know? But there's an argument that many of my libertarian friends growing up had that, that before libertarianism was cool or whatever was that the civil rights movement, the fact that it was handled through the courts brought tension, more tension in America, even though it solved the problem. Whereas if it would have been handled through the churches, there would have been more deaths, more pain, more just really bad stuff, right? But it, and it would have taken much longer, but it would have solved it socially. And, and man, that's the reason why I don't agree with it is because like, look, man, we're, where we're at, you know, why, why are you you know, I get that you bring that up, but it's almost like you're bringing it up out of resentment. But we do need to understand that there is a social phenomenon that everybody has to agree to. You know, there's a difference. So when we look at Germany, Germany, you go to Germany, the first time I went was in like 2008. And you got people who were like, very aware of the Holocaust and all these different things. But I remember in that time in 2008 or nine, they were talking about neo-Nazism coming back. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's not like, like, no, man, if you go out, if you go to the small towns, if you go to Austria, you go to these different areas, like um, if you go to Hitler's house, there's people that like, well, I'm like, what are you talking about, man? Because everybody there is so aware that it was wrong. But there was a suppression of people that didn't get to get voiced, whether it's right or wrong right, or whether we agree on it socially that didn't get to get voiced as an individual, that started to come up as a collective, that were like, man, we got screwed over in World War II, or whatever the narrative is. And the same thing that could happen with uh, white people, Caucasian people in the US, um, and then it could even move into class, that this is being suppressed and not talked about, and then they're pissed off, and uh, you know, all these different things. So. How, how do we come up with a voice for people? Or is it that? Or do we just go back to working with the individual? I, I, think, it, I think it is a lot that, like right now we use, we use force because it's, it's so quick, you know? So we pass a law and we can force things or send people to jail if they don't obey the new law of like mm -hmm. being, acting like good people, right? Yeah. Like if you don't use the, if you use these words, then you're a racist and so you need to go to prison or you need to get fired from your job or whatever. Right. We can force the outward expression of what looks like good behavior, but you can't force a soul. You can't force a mind. Yeah. And so if we want that long-term transformation, um, I think that the short-term solutions a lot of times could backfire because it just, 
it builds up a resentment. It builds up like, you don't understand me. You falsely accuse me. And right. they become, they become entrenched and defensive and even more right. angry. And then, and then they become who you feared that they were. Right. Yeah. I, I have a really interesting story. I, w- I went uh, 2009 to Germany for the first time. And uh, there was a German woman out there who was, who she had attended my big event and then she was trying to teach my, my work in, in German, which I thought was fascinating. So I went over there to hang out with her and, and, um, her father was actually a German soldier in World War II. He wasn't actually a Nazi, but he did volunteer for the war at like 16 years of age. Sure. He wasn't like Hitler Youth or something, but in my mind, he's like, he's a Nazi. You know? <laughs> and because uh, that's the only way I can think of a, you know, like a German yeah, yeah. soldier. Who no, I know German, I know German people who were Hitler Youth and, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a whole complex thing, but go ahead. Yeah. So, but her father was fighting for the German army and soldiers to keep their same name and stuff like this and some of their same emblems and stuff because he felt like like you, you just judge all of us, put us all in this one category and shame all of us. Like we were there fighting for our country. We were there defending our homeland. We were there defending our families and, and, and whatever. And so I thought it was fascinating, but he had this thing that he was doing every year where he would get together on the same mountain in Northern Italy um, with uh, opposing soldiers who had been like firing at each other. And like um, some of them had killed each other's best friend and stuff like this. And they would get together on this mountaintop. They would dress in their uniform and they would just stand in front of each other and they, they would weep. You know, and and to me, this was like this was mm-hmm. honor. This was an honoring right. process. Yeah. It was an honoring ceremony, and uh, I remember, I remember going to meet him, and uh, and we, <laughs> we got to the hospital. He was in the hospital, and my friend said, "Go ahead, knock on the door." You know, you knock on the door, and I knock on the door, and this tall German guy opens the door, like steely, gray blue eyes, just like looking down at me, and I'm like looking up, like in this moment, like. I'm staring in the eyes of a Nazi, you know, just this idea in my head. I have a Nazi and he he's, and we're going to meet with him and he turns around to walk, go get dressed. And he's wearing like a hospital gown. He turns around his, you know, his bare ass, you know, walking away was this contrast that just made me wake up from my, you know, in my head, he's a yeah, Nazi. Right. You know what I mean? And then we go and sit down with him and talk. And I learn about this process. and. Um, it's here's an example of a guy who felt in the german in germany's effort to right the wrongs it has to involve it had to involve for them judging an entire group of people many of whom were just doing what they thought was right right they weren't all like nazi prison guards and this and that so i i think the pathway forward is through honoring not through judging it's, it's through it's through um if you, I, this is this would be pretty controversial but even map this onto the the white and black situation in america right now the black lives matter and all this sort of thing um i think that rather than trying to force everyone to adopt let's say the black lives matter position and and say the same slogans put our fist in the air and show solidarity and become allies with them and all this sort of thing um what what you're going to get if you force that compliance with enough judgment with enough fear of losing your job or authorization and stuff like this you if you do it through force and judgment you're just gonna build up an oppositionary force i mean i could see as a as a as one of the outcomes of this a, a a a movement of white people who feel like we're not racist but fuck black lives matter yeah this is bullshit and then they and then black lives matter in a way creates the very opposition that yeah. they fear of white supremacy and this is the problem like you can't because you can't force a mind or a heart and so the idea would be instead for both sides to get present to what the other side is facing and standing for not forcing each side to agree on the conclusions and judgments that each other has. 
You know, it's interesting that libertarian argument, which is not all libertarians, this is like a few of my friends were like 20 or something like that, thinking about the world's problems and just theoretical stuff. But they would say, you know, like if the courts didn't change stuff, you know, more deaths would have happened, but it would have had a more lasting change or something along those lines. But I think that, I think there does need to be force at a certain point when society gets out of control, but then it is up to society. This is so important. Or sometimes it may not be, but sometimes force is necessary and it's a reality of our world. But the thing that we can change is, is that we can have more leadership of sharing, you know, how do we do this right? How do we do this as a community? And if we don't do that, the scarcity comes in with a charismatic leader that is pissed off and coming from the angle of scarcity which is going to be like fights and, you know, fuck shit up. Right. And, and it's too easy. Right. Uh, like there, there does need to be a time where the rules do need to be put down. And I'm not like, I can't tell you if that's happening now correctly or incorrectly, because I, I won't know until 10 years, 15, 20 years out. And the sad thing is, is most people won't remember this, right. And, and how important it is, but how we handle whatever happens when the dust settles is the most important part. You know, it, it is what makes the difference with how this gets exploited or not. And one thing, you know, you bring this up, which is really interesting, and you use the word honoring, but the greatness of man, the healing of man, the empowerment of man or woman, that, that what is going to make you the best person is independent, totally independent, of your religious beliefs, your political perspective, your left or right leanings, all that it has to do in order for it to fit in the world is be able to fit. Meaning it can't like take away from anybody or step on each other's toes in those ways, but you can become the best person in wherever you're at. So start where you're at. That doesn't mean you need to pick something. That means you need to start where you're at. And people aren't realizing that. That, that if somebody in whatever of any of these communities, you know, the woman's community, the men's community, the, the uh, African-American community, if you start with where you're at and, and stop looking for these answers outside and, and find this- Time to become a better person yourself. Oh, absolutely. And, and to understand the principles and morals. Like you could have taken your hate and anger of when you were 14 and I'm sure certain siblings that you had reacted in this way because every family so dynamic and different and had it totally affect your life in negative ways that you could never get over, you know, but instead you took it in this other perspective where it had problems. It still may have problems, but there's a solution where you can, you can, you can go like, man, I have this pain and can find personal excellence and worldly excellence or whatever you want to call it, you know, freedom to it. And not enough people think that, you know, you came to my house and right when I did started my separation and you saw these other guys like, man, there's so much pain around men and um, around that. And it's like, yeah, but that's necessary. Like you, you, everybody needs to have that pain. What they need, I think, is some culture telling them what they can do with that pain. You know, that doesn't yeah, involve the the shortcut that we can all take is to join some group that tells us that we are right and the others are wrong. Then we don't have to deal with our shit. We can just instantly go to war with the bad guys. Right. And all we need to do is whether it's join the Ku Klux Klan or join Black Lives Matter or join the Mormons or join the Catholics, instantly by joining, we can feel like I'm superior to and the problem is out there. The problem is not me. The problem right. is out there. And we need to destroy the other side or fix the other yeah. side or whatever the other side. Yeah. That's, that's what we have to watch out for because uh, nothing good comes from that. You know? But it, man, it's very attractive. Why not take the shortcut? We're a culture yeah, obsessed know, It's, it's the time. easy way, right? So yeah. you don't have to do anything. Yeah. Yeah, but it, the worst the part about that is the best shortcuts or the worst shortcuts you could say last for a long time as a functioning tool, you know, as a coping mechanism. And then 10 years later, you know, they show back up. It's, uh, mm. I, that's always why I'm like happy for being such a screw up in my life because you take somebody that, if you have a drug problem, you tend to get hammered pretty good and pretty quick. 
you either die or you figure out you, what you're doing is wrong. And so you become a little bit more humble and open-minded towards things. But um, God, man, you see these people with like some pain, you know, that's another thing. It's like, we have a society that's so good. It's so awesome that it can handle a lot of tension and pain. But then what happens when that tension and pain doesn't get dealt with and is distracted for, you know, for years where people don't have to look at it and it becomes culturally, and man, it pisses people off. Well, you know? you're a great example. You know, you took your pain and you turned it into something beautiful where you can help other people with that pain. You know, it's, uh, it's when, you, when we get into saying, oh, well, this person has less pain than me. They've got more privilege, they whatever, and, and what we need to do is take away something from them. Like as soon as the problem becomes externalized and, and I don't have to do anything, it just tends not to be the, I don't think the most powerful approach to making things right. If what we want to do is make things fair, make it, the world a more beautiful place, it's the most that, it, the best way is, is for each of us to find the best way to improve ourselves and become more loving, become more uh, creative, become more uh, uh, responsible, become more the one who is willing to be the change in the world. And, uh, yeah, dude, th this is an interesting thing that you bring up because this happens all the time in like a counseling therapeutic environment, depending on the style, like maybe in group therapy, but somebody will come in and they'll be sulking about their problems and they're bad. And of course you get to their bad, but they're so caught up in the victimhood and, and, and all this, that somebody within that group will have something which is just way worse, like, you know, incomprehensibly worse, but that's a tool to shut somebody up, you know, that's a moment of force. But the real solution after that is that you need to accept responsibility and own it. But, but in order to get to even that perspective of that value, you have to realize that one, you're safe, that other people feel this, that there's some unification, that it isn't that bad. Maybe you need to break, you know, maybe you need to completely let go and, and you know, lose everything or emotionally or metaphorically or whatever. But the, what's so interesting about this whole thing of, of healing is everybody does need to hear your story, but they need to hear it at the right time. Like again, to be a person that's excellent, to be a person that shares the deepest compassion and the deepest love, you got to understand people and you have to hear their story. And that is independent of your belief system you know, the traumas, the tragedies, all these different things, because your pain is your pain. Your hangnail is going to hurt worse than my broken leg because it's yours and you feel it. But we can't, when we're so socially separated, or if I'm so into my identity that prevents me from talking to just you as an individual, I can't hear that. And so we need to get to that point where we can do that. And maybe we don't start there. Maybe I don't start with talking to the opposite of me. Maybe I start with talking to what's similar to me, but understanding that this is about human unity, that we all have it, you know, but, but I might need to decompress a little bit, but we all have it. My, my, me only talking to addicts, this is the great thing about like addiction stuff is like I talk to people that are only addicts. Sometimes I talk to only men that are addicts, but the purpose isn't that men addicts or male addicts have it you know, in this unique way that's so identifying to me. It's so that I can talk about personal stuff that maybe female addicts can't understand and that I can bring it back into the unification of everybody because that is what serves it. And then, you know, I may only talk to addicts, but that's not so I could be better than or less than in society. That's so that I could remove the filter that tells me that it's different. You know, it's my job to understand when somebody cuts me off on the freeway, I get angry just like everybody else, but it's my job to go, man, I don't know what that person's going through. Did it harm me? Did it, you know, it's my job to start integrating the spiritual principles into that or the life principles into that, that don't have anything to do with religion or culture. Yeah. And man, it's, uh, it's weird, man. Human beings that talk like this don't sit in their homes and not take the adventure of life. Human beings that talk like this, that get to these insights that, that really help us are people that have felt pain. You know, human beings that can move here 
move to this are open-minded enough, usually from a break in pain that gets us there. And I think that that's a very important thing that people need to understand. And I think this is what you, you promote with traveling and working on her and all these different things. Um, yeah. And sometimes shit needs to be burned to the ground. <laughs> well, it's, it's I, I'm definitely it. not like, I'm definitely not like a, a pacifist or whatever. Like, as much as I talk about honor and, and the peaceful way and, and, and all this, as you do, compassion and everything, you know, I mean, uh, had we not fought with the British some 244 years ago, you know, or so, uh, would we even have the country that we do, you know? You know, something that's a great topic that I love to explore sometime is, um, and we may not have time today, but, this idea of judging our forefathers for ways that they weren't perfect, I think it's 100% tied to the way that we judge our own fathers. And then it prevents us from becoming the men who we most desire to be. Right. Um, you know, and Jordan Peterson talks about rescuing our father from the underworld. And uh, I relate that to uh, judgment. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... I see it playing out in society at large. Um, I think most of the people who are so angry at America and the patriarchy and um, white male supremacy and all this, I think a lot of them have daddy issues. You know, that can sound like a judgment. Maybe it is a little bit, but I think uh, I think most of those people would be well served to do the work of honoring their own father and then would we'll be able to see a new and more beautiful and powerful way yeah. to transform yeah. their life. Yeah, you know, um you mentioned time and we should probably wrap it up, but that is a good, good topic. And I think it even ties into other stuff is how men deal with daddy issues or male problems in their life than women because they're completely different. And it's so huge, man. Once I started coaching, I just realized like how many men like had problems with their fathers and then how many men still looked up to their fathers, but didn't during their childhood because their parents split or something like that. And it was just such a weird unifying theme that just came up over and over and over again. And it's interesting because a whole bunch of people watch and listen to Jordan Peterson, like people who talk about like, you know, Nietzsche or Jungian psychology, you listen to Jordan Peterson, a bunch of people that are political, a bunch of whatever, but a lot of really angry, broken young men that listen to Jordan Peterson and turn it into some crazy shit. I, like, look, the dude's a very smart guy, but talk to your father, talk to your neighbor, talk to the people around you and stop searching for a hero because a boy that is hurt needs a hero. And that may be what you need right now, but you need to understand that your journey, your path of empowerment can't be about always idolizing somebody iconically around you. Um, people are great people, you know. Um, there, there's people- well, what's, what's sad is that a lot of guys today, they have no father figure. They have no yeah. man, oh, totally. older man yeah. in their Jesus. life. yeah. That, that they really respect and admire and want to be like, who they also feel cares about them and is going to stand up for them. And I think that's what a lot of guys see in Jordan Peterson. And if you don't have anyone in your life like that, and he's the only one, I can see how they would, you know, idolize him to that yeah. extent, you know? Well, there's but, a huge uh, culture of that. Yeah. Just obsessed. Yeah. You know, it's funny because when I split with my ex, people like emailed me like irate, like, like even a couple of days ago, some guy was like, you know, what about you? You say you honor commitment. You say whatever. What happened till death to his part? And I'm like, man, that's, that's not the way to talk to me for one. And then why don't you ask her, you know, because to me, I felt like I, I had that sort of commitment. But the thing is, is like, why is that important to you? Why is that at all a need to, to, I mean, maybe you don't know that it might be wrong to me. You're, you're only going to get one type of answer. You're going to get a confrontation from that. You know, you're not going <laughs> right. to get like some sort of dialogue. But like to, to see how that upset men that I don't really know that well, 
you know, just shows me it's like, wow, man, why did you give well, me that much power? You know? Well, probably his father broke oh, up yeah. with his mother and he blames his 100%, father. 100%. 100%. Or I think in his case, his mother and father broke up and who knows why, maybe there was infidelity, but then the mother gaslit him for years and then he had to have this whole coming of age of realizing his dad wasn't bad or maybe flawed in these ways. And it's so weird to look at that. It's like, dude, man, you just packed in intellect and argument. Like, like it's so weird because when we get to the higher levels of talking, there is no truth. Like it's a man-made, amongst humans, there's truth. But in the, the natural world, um, in, in just biology itself, there's no truth. There's only what works and what isn't. There's no one thing countering the other. There's no one thing choosing to lie. There only is, right? And so you could call that truth. But in the man-made context of truth, it has to do with like the opposite of deception or the opposite of lies, which only happen amongst, you know, sentient beings that get to decide. And of human beings, you know, that's at a high level. So we worship this truth and allow our pain to exploit it in so many ways and don't see it. And, and we call it the thing that we're going to die for. And I do think that belief is fundamental for humans. We need it. But check this out. Throughout history, society has flourished more than it has been broken from things that turned out to be lies. And now lies can cause harm. But dude, you, you know, like uh, some... Greek mythology was an amazing, you know, it was a part of their religion. We see it as untruth, you know? Well, we clinging to, that. yes, clinging to some kind of truth makes everything a lot simpler, a lot easier. Yeah. If there's a clear black, if there's a clear bad guy and a clear good guy, it makes yeah. everything, it makes life a lot easier. Uh, all you got to do is step on the side of the good guys and then you're <laughs> one of the good guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's a lot more difficult to be in the unknown, to remain in the mystery and in the question and say, who is this guy really? What does he really think? Right. What is he feeling? What? That's a lot more difficult. It's a lot easier to just say, uh, F that guy. Yeah. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Anyway, man, you got to go enjoy the day. Yeah, F you, man. Yeah, F you, America. <laughs> Freedom of speech for you, baby. Um, Anyway, man, what, how do people find you or what do you want them to go to? You know, you're kind of like this dude that, you know, works with men, but, you, but I don't know if you're trying to be prominent with it or hold more intimate groups. And you know, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? MakeMenGreatAgain.com. Is that really it? No, no I'm just kidding. It's uh, ReturnOfThePatriarchy.com. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That, no, website. dude, that, that's some um, for real stuff, dude. Like I, I would have yeah. laughed and thought you were joking five years ago, but the, the, I guarantee you those things exist. No, I actually, I like both of those names. You know, I, I like the return of the patriarchy, not in the way that people uh, fear it and judge it though, but in a beautiful sense, like the return of the father in a, in a positive way, the return of men and the authority yeah. and leadership of men in a positive way. But you wanted to have that dig that could piss people off and get you the on controversy, the man. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want the controversy. Can't, can't be return of the father. It can't be <laughs> return of the masculine. It's gotta be, nah, um, man, I got to push some buttons, you know, yeah, gotta, yeah. yeah I, I like that excitement. You know, so yeah. anyway, no, uh, most of my websites are quite old. So, um, Ronan radio. Yeah. Uh, Hans, my podcast right now, Ronan radio. So check us out there. Hear more, uh, YouTube about, about men, honor, the patriarchy brotherhood all that sort of thing and that's on youtube and uh what else itunes and youtube and okay cool uh, facebook man that itunes setup is such a pain in the butt to get that we're thing. on uh we're on uh instagram as well on radio cool all right man good stuff good talking to you go about your day thank you steve uh, great talking a, to you man yeah definitely definitely happy right. uh independence day that's right it's fourth of july Woo! yes fireworks yes. not so even any freedom white man yeah, yeah, yeah. Like hot dogs. Celebrate your whiteness. And... Exactly. That's that's <laughs> you. You really. I'm only half white, man. <laughs> okay. they, don't, they don't include me. All right. Take it easy, man. All right, buddy. Yeah. 
And hey, thank you so much for watching. Again, find out Michael, find out about Michael with the links down below, Ronin Radio. That's something that he does with Hans. Hans is interviewed in another podcast. You should definitely check that out and give it a like, give it a share, you know, share this dialogue with people. Use this medium as a tool for you to express yourself. And most importantly, man, I want to talk to everybody. I want to talk to you. If you have recommendations, let me know and let's do this. All right. Talk soon.